with nursing. Uh, welcome to the third annual Werner Huffman Splain Lecture, made possible through a generous gift of Dr. Richard Splain and the Splain family. As a quick FYI, this uh, session is going to be recorded for those people who couldn't join us in person. Some of you will have had the pleasure of knowing and or working with Werner Huffman Splain. Werner attended the School of Nursing, as it then was, at the University of Toronto, obtaining a diploma in public health nursing in 1939. She eventually went on to become Canada's first chief nursing officer and served in that role until 1972. Throughout her career as an advocate for the health of the public, she concentrated on national and international health planning, policy development, and the extended role of the nurse. Today's guest speaker exemplifies what it means to be an advocate for public health. Dr. Naomi Tulin is a nurse practitioner and researcher committed to tackling the social structural inequities that cause and perpetuate youth homelessness. As assistant professor at the McMaster University School of Nursing, she is also an affiliate scientist at the MAP Centre for Urban Health Solutions at St Michael's Hospital and an academic fellow at the Centre for Critical Qualitative Health Research at the University of Toronto. Naomi completed her PhD here at Bloomberg Nursing in 2017. While pursuing her PhD, she completed the collaborative doctoral program in global health at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health and obtained a certificate of advanced methodological training in qualitative research from the Center for Critical Qualitative Health Research. She maintains a part-time nurse practitioner practice at Covenant House, Toronto, and the Youth Wellness Centre in Hamilton. In today's lecture, Dr. Tuline will share findings from her doctoral work, a 10-month ethnographic study where she spent extensive time walking in the shoes of nine young people as they transitioned from homelessness into market rent housing. Her experience conducting this research has made her a tireless advocate for finding solutions to help facilitate young people's transition away from homelessness and to prevent homelessness from reoccurring. With youth homelessness a serious concern in Canada, Dr. Tuline's research that focuses on testing interventions designed to improve social integration outcomes for young people who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless is vitally important. It's an honour and a pleasure to have Naomi speak this evening on this timely and important topic. Welcome, Naomi. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, and uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for making the time to come and listen to me speak at the end of probably what's been a long day for everybody, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much to Dr. Johnson uh, for inviting me to come and speak, and thank you to Dr. Richard Splain and the Splain family um, for supporting this annual public health lecture. So I'm gonna to speak to you for the next 35, 40 minutes, and then there'll be some time for questions and answers um, at the end. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get going. So I didn't think it would be right to start a public health and nursing lecture without uh, referring to Florence Nightingale, um, who was, as you know, was an ardent advocate for public health nursing. And uh, Florence Nightingale had a critique of what was going on at the time in the late 1800s with the poor. And that was that women from charities were coming and they were offering sympathy to the poor and not much else. And there was a thought that maybe this is something that nurses should be doing. And so she said, it is utter waste to have a highly trained and skilled nurse do this, simply offer kindness to the poor, without counting the demoralizing and pauperizing influence on the sick poor. And so what she was getting at there was that nurses actually should be looking at the poor and tackling the social and structural inequities that are causing them to be poor and causing them to be sick. 
So speaking of charity, that's actually where my journey began and so and still continues. I have spent the last 10 years working at Covenant House Toronto and Covenant House is Canada's largest agency for young people that are experiencing homelessness. And we have a fabulous uh, clinic there and I'm honored to be a part of that clinic. And really that is what propelled me to go back to school a little bit later in life and get my PhD because I wanted to um, do, help us do a better job of assisting young people when they left the shelter system. Uh, but to be honest, before I did my PhD, you know, when a young person used to come and see me in clinic and they told me that they were housed, I would say, that's amazing. And I would give them a high five because I really thought that because they're these amazing young people, that the door would open once they left the shelter to all of this opportunity out there. But instead, once I did my PhD and I journeyed with these young people, I found that society indeed is not equitable for these young people and it wasn't welcoming at all. So just before I get going, I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page about youth homelessness in Canada. So unfortunately on any given night, there are at least six to 7,000 young people without a place to sleep. And by young people, I mean young people aged 13 to 24 years of age. And at any point during the year, we have between 35 and 40,000. And these numbers might seem like a lot to you, but the reality is, is that the majority of young people that experience homelessness actually are couch surfing. So they're not counted in these numbers. So the numbers are much higher than this. So we actually know a lot about what brings young people to the streets, what keeps them there. Uh, there's been hundreds of papers published um, over decades on this issue, but we know very little about how to help them move from the margins of society over to the mainstream. And the, some of the things that we know about young people that have experienced homelessness is that um, overwhelmingly, they tend to come from homes where they've experienced physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. More than half of them have come up through the child welfare system. Most often they have grown up in poverty. There are certain groups of young people that are overrepresented. Their mental health uh, and physical health tends to be worse than that of their house peers. Uh, for example, uh, in 2016, there was a study done of 1,100 young people across 46 communities in Canada, and 42% of them had tried to commit suicide at least once. Um, when we look at their education and their employment, they tend to have uh, about 70% of them haven't finished high school, and only about 30% of them are formally employed. And before I did my, when in, uh, did my field work in 2015, there were only two longitudinal studies looking at in the world, looking at what it's like for young people once they become housed. And uh, you know, five years later, honestly, it's, it's not much better in terms of longitudinal studies on housed youth. At the time, there were no studies done looking at what it's like for young people once they get into market rent housing. And this is really important because you know, we don't have enough subsidized housing to go around. So this is where most young people end up. And still today, there's really no rigorous interventions targeting social and economic inclusion as a primary outcome measure. And I'm trying to change that. Um, but usually we look at outcome measures like maybe housing stability, maybe substance use, but we don't look at social and economic inclusion, typically. So those are kind of the stats and I wanna just make this a little bit more real. And I wanna tell you a story about a young person that was in my study. And uh, you know, five years later, I, I was actually just talking to her two weeks ago. I still keep in touch with many of the participants from my doctoral work. And this is an actual picture of her, but I'm not gonna use her real name, but she gave me permission again to talk about her and show her picture. And I wanna tell you her story just so you can appreciate the complexity of exiting homelessness. So Alexandra, when I met her, moved from Africa with her family. They settled uh, in a racialized community in Toronto. Unfortunately, she grew up in an abusive home. Her stepdad was quite abusive. And one night in a, after a particularly bad fight, he kicked her out. And so she it was the middle of the night and, and she phoned a woman that had befriended her. And so the woman came and picked her up and let Alexandra stay there and gave her some food and, and bought her some really nice clothing. Um, but after a while, she said, you know what, um, I, I want you to do some sexual favors for me and for my clients. And so then Alexandra, unfortunately, became sexually trafficked. And so she was in that situation for several months. And then after about eight months, she said, I don't want to do this anymore. And the woman said, fine, you can leave, but then you need to give me back all the clothes that I've given you. And she found her and you can't stay here. Uh, so she found herself homeless and back at Covenant House. And that is actually where I met her. 
And to further complicate things, and, and this is very common when our young people come from other countries, um, she thought she was 17 at the time and she actually thought she'd finished grade 12 because in her country she had, but when they reassessed her in Canada, they said, no, you haven't even finished grade 10. You're about halfway through grade 10. So when I met her, she was a full-time student. And then because her parents couldn't support her, number one, they, they weren't willing to support her. And number two, they were on welfare themselves. She had to support herself uh, with a welfare subsidy. Just to give you an idea, welfare subsidies um, for people on Ontario Works without a disability are around $700 a month. So for Alexandra, by the time she finished paying rent and bought a transit pass so she could get around, she had less than $50 left a month to pay for everything. Uh, so because of that, she was on the wait list for affordable housing. Uh, just to give you guys an idea about affordable housing in Toronto, um, you know, I looked about a month ago and there were uh, just over 100,000 households, not individuals, on the wait list for affordable housing. Uh, the, the wait list is multiple years long and, and young people know this, but she was on the wait list. To further complicate things, her stepdad took out a bunch of credit cards in her name and defaulted on all of them. And she was told she had no recourse but to declare bankruptcy. But if you declare bankruptcy, apparently you don't qualify for OSAP. And she really wanted to go back to school, actually, and become a nurse. Um, but she didn't know how she was going to pay for this. So what she did was what a lot of young people do that exit homelessness. They take these under the table cash jobs because once you start, if you are uh, receiving welfare and you start working, you're allowed to keep the first $200 of what you make. But then after that, welfare deducts 50 cents for every dollar that you make off your welfare check. And so young people don't want this to happen. So she, so she went to school full-time during the day. She cleaned office uh, towers on, on the weekends. And the guy that she was working for persistently made these sexual advances at her or paid her less than what she was owed. And so the question becomes, what does Alexandra and young people like Alexandra need to fully participate in society? And so that became the focus of my doctoral work. I really wanted to produce an insider perspective on the experiences of formerly homeless young people as they transitioned into independent or market rent housing and try to achieve equitable, meaning fair, uh, social and economic inclusion. The way I like to explain it is if you think of society as a big circle and the young people are standing on the outside of the circle, what sorts of things do they need to move inside the circle and really feel like they belong? And so uh, it, like I, I saw my, uh, my former supervisor uh, sign in, Dr. Denise Gastaldo, who's an amazing supervisor, but um, uh, those of you who do uh, qualitative research will know it's just so imperative that you have a really good framework to understand your data. And it was really complex for me because I wanted to capture the objective stuff that was going on like around poverty and education, but I also wanted to capture the subjective, like what it's like to be the other in society and feel really lonely and disconnected. So I ended up choosing a conceptual framework and then a theoretical lens as well. I'm just gonna spend a minute on this conceptual framework because I critique this framework and I, I changed it a little bit at the end of my study. So this is a framework from the, the WHO, the World Health Organization on the social determinants of health. Often in Canada, when we talk about the social determinants of health, we kind of talk about them like these equally important group of, uh, you know, clump of factors. But the WHO separated them and they said, no, you know what, some are more important than others. So if you just quickly walk through this, starting from left to right, that tallest box there on the left, your social, economic, and political context of your life, for all of us, that's really the most important thing. That's kind of where the buck stops. The next thing is your social economic position. Really, if you think of that like a ladder in life, where are you on the ladder? How much power do you have? Um, the higher up the ladder you are, the more power you have in society. And the things that feed into how much power you have in society are things like your class, your gender, your race, your education, your occupation, and your income. And together, those things are called structural determinants. And those feed into intermediary determinants like you can see there, there's our healthcare system, material circumstances like where you might live. And then finally, all of that impacts our equity and health and well being. And we know that health is not just physical health, it's mental health and spiritual health as well. So that was my conceptual framework. And then I use post colonial feminist theory as my theoretical lens. And I'm not going to get too much into that, 
except to say that postcolonial feminist theory is located within a critical social paradigm. So we know when we say we're going in with a critical social paradigm, right away we're looking at power imbalances in society. And one of the concepts that I use from postcolonial feminist theory was intersectionality. And it's a little bit more of a complex and a nuanced way of understanding health inequities. Um, so for example, I am biracial. So my dad is from Sri Lanka. My mom is from Scotland. Um, I am also an immigrant. I immigrated here from Sri Lanka when I was seven years old and I'm also a woman. And so I can't separate those things out. Those things all mix up together and they very much influence how I experience the world. And that's intersectionality. So I embraced that in, my, in the way that I looked at my work. And then knowledge construction, we start with the stories from the marginalized and then we link back to macro level inequities. And then finally, when you say that you're going in with a critical social paradigm, you know right away that that person is looking at research as a way to transform communities. It's a very much a social justice kind of a tool. The other thing that's really important is that knowledge production takes place not in, in academia, not in sort of our, our, our very towers where we work, but in the margins of society. So my job really was to go to the margins of society and take the knowledge of somebody that would be considered the other and then overlap my more privileged knowledge. And then between the two of us, we could, would come up with a new way of looking at a problem. Hopefully that would transform the community. For my design, I used ethnography, which ethnography basically means just hanging out with people, trying to walk in their shoes. I used critical ethnography, which means I was going to be critiquing the choices that they were able to make given the context of their lives. Uh, I met with nine young people for 10 months. I met with them every other week. I didn't use a car. The study was uh, done in Toronto. And I, because I wanted to see, I mean, to the best that I could, what it was like to be them. So I walked a lot and I took a lot of public transit for 10 months in all different kinds of weather. And I met them wherever they wanted to meet. And most often it was at their home, but sometimes outside and I met their family and friends and wherever they worked. And so it was great. And by the end of it, I conducted 119 interviews. So I'm gonna go through my three sort of main findings. I'm gonna start with a quote from one of the participants and I'm gonna unpack that a bit for you. And you'll see that I have pictures and the pictures are meant to depict sort of what the young person looked like, but it's not actually the young person. And they all got to pick their own pseudonyms and those are the names I'm going to use. There is one picture that is actually of a young person in the study and I'll point that out when we get to it. So precarious existence. So this is Phoenix, and this is actually his final interview. And he's trying to explain to me why he lost his job and he loved this job, but he was late for the third time in a row. So here's what he said. I'm tired of the struggle, the struggle. I'm looking at my paycheck. This lady is telling me I'm only going to get $8 from welfare. And that's because of those clawbacks I was telling you about. And that stresses you out. I'm only getting $8 from welfare. So now I'm already worrying about January and December. It's just a stressful thing to wake up every day. And you know, it blocks off me wanting to go to work. It blocks off me wanting to hang out with people. It's not really a depression state. I just get very introverted and it sucks because you can't be like that. You have to be professional and go to work. It's easier said than done. So what contributed to their precarious existence was really three main types of inequities, financial, social, and age-based. So most of the young people, as I mentioned, were on welfare, and that worked out to just under $8,000 a year. Our low-income cutoff or our poverty line is around $20,000 a year for a single person living in a city like Toronto. Um, most of the jobs that they had to me were like these dead end sort of, and by that I mean like minimum wage, part-time kind of jobs that could end at any minute. And I already mentioned the welfare clawbacks. Social inequities. So, you know, they had very limited social capital. So the notion of using your social connections as currency to help you move forward. They knew a lot of people that could kind of help them get by, but very few people that could help them get ahead. And finally, age-based inequities. So at the time of this study, and this is the latest data that I have on this, 63% uh, of Canadian youth still live at home. That number has been growing since the 80s. Um, and so if you think about it, from that perspective, we are expecting these young people to do something that most young people can't do anymore. And they have less resources than most young people. So it's really kind of setting them up for failure. 
A different perspective is identity. I did not go into the study at all to look at identity, but it became a key finding and now I can't unsee it. I see it everywhere. So this is Philip, a different perspective and also his final interview. And he says, the thing is adversity and poverty breed tremendous inner strength and maturity and also a lot of creativity. But the outside world, they don't understand what comes out of hardship. They don't understand it's surviving through hardship and developing resiliency. That's really the part of it that's interesting. That's something you should try to revive in your own life. I mentioned that I would talk about the picture that actually was a picture. So this is, this is actually Phoenix. Um, he took me up to the Jane and Finch area where he grew up and he was at the boys and he wanted to take me to the boys and girls club because it was such a positive influence in his life. And he was walking by and just touching the wall and I, I snapped a picture of him. So the shift in place away from the shelter resulted in a shift in identity. Um, they saw their home as an important marker of success and rightly so. But at the same time, they were really aware of what society thinks about homeless people. And they used some pretty derogatory language to refer to homeless people, which surprised me. The other thing that was really illuminating for me working in the shelter was that many of the supports available to young people exiting homelessness are actually located in the shelter system because we think it's more convenient and familiar to them. But that reminds them of their old identities and they don't necessarily want to go back there. And in fact, during the study, I saw young people underutilize supports emerging adulthood. So they wanted to be seen and respected as independent, responsible and competent young adults. At the same time, they were working through other issues. So we think back to how I'm using intersectionality here. So Phoenix, for example, as you can tell, he's a black young man. So, you know, most places in North America, a black young man is more likely to be stopped by police. So in addition to not having enough money, worried, you know, about work and losing his place, he was worried about being stopped by police. And he was also wrestling through his sexual orientation at the time of the study. So he just had a lot going on, as did all of the young people in the study. Their identities were also fragile. I learned that they were really linked to more external tangible things like their house, except their house, they could lose that at any time. Um, they had limited internal sort of these intangible based assets, like a sense of purpose and control and self efficacy and self esteem. They had a bit of it, but not enough. And what they did have was really eroded all the time throughout time because, um, you know, life was so hard for them. The other thing I learned was about their education. So I mentioned to you that only about 30% of young people have finished high school, but in this study, about 60% of them had finished high school. Uh, but then they told me, you know what, Naomi, that high school diploma means nothing. I was streamlined after, I mean, they didn't use the word streamlined, but I knew what they meant. After grade eight, I was told that I, you know, I, I I wasn't cut out for the academic stream. I was the applied stream. And so they just internalized that. And then they, they, their grades kind of went downhill and they hung out with different people. And so they ended up passing, but they weren't very confident in their education. The final finding is about their sense of mastery and control being undermined. Ashley was the only young person that was able to maintain a job throughout the study. And this is month seven, but still here's what she says. I just live day to day. Now I live day to day. My situation doesn't make it possible to think far ahead. It doesn't work now. Something always comes up that I need to pay for. This picture is something that I sketched one day when I was feeling really frustrated with what I was seeing and I didn't know how to articulate it in words. That's meant to be a house and inside is a young person stuck in a hamster wheel of poverty not able to move forward. On the outside, it looks like they're successfully housed, but inside they're struggling. And so that's exactly what I saw that over time they kind of got stuck and they couldn't move forward. And they kind of had this lack of purpose and vision for their life and they got tired. And I learned about the concept of identity capital. As I mentioned, I didn't go into the study to look at identity. The notion of identity capital is that all of us use our self-concept as currency to pull us forward when life gets hard. For example, right now, working during a pandemic, right? We all have to use identity capital, uh, but I found that they didn't have enough of that. Um, poverty became part of their identity. You know, we're in a consumer oriented culture and they were marked as inadequate consumers in this culture. 
you know, at first, at first I used the term frivolous consumption when young people would do things like someone would give them 50 bucks for their birthday or something. And instead of doing what I thought they should do with the money, like save it or get food, they would do things like most often they would buy runners. But I learned that runners were a marker of success in a consumer oriented culture. We all do this. Our houses are markers of success, our clothes. Um, and so they were just trying to participate that way as well. I learned, uh, you know, ironically, they were still the other that exiting the shelter actually magnified how unfair their life chances were. And over time, I saw that they viewed life more like a game of chance, something they didn't have as much control over, which is why my hamster wheel is actually supposed to look like the, the, the spinner for the game of life and the young person is supposed to be the spinner. And I saw them focus, you know, when, when they left the shelter system, they were so excited. They had all these plans for the future. And I was excited right alongside with them. But very quickly, I saw them just focus on day to day survival with this, you know, loss of a sense of control over longer term outcomes. So back to sort of where we began, how can we help advocate for equitable opportunity for young people exiting homelessness? And how can we help young people like Alexandra achieve meaningful social and economic inclusion? Well, I think there's three main things and they all have to do with forms of capital or currency in society financial capital. So I mentioned housing already. I think we need to have more subsidized housing for young people. Again, by the time they paid for their, their rent and they got a transit pass, they, ha they had less than $50. Most of them had around 40 to buy everything. Education, I'd love to see our young people be able to get you know, a free ride scholarship. I think in this age of you know, globalization, automation, artificial intelligence, we need to be really strategic and work with these young people to think about what sorts of education pathways or training pathways make sense for them in terms of being able to move forward. And then a living wage, um, definitely. As I mentioned, they were trying to live on $8,000 a year relationships, social capital, they need that. Um, identity capital, so again, self-esteem, a sense of control, self-efficacy and purpose in life, they need more, more of that. And when you see this, you might think, well, that's obvious um, because this is what you would want for your loved ones. And those of you that might have children, this is how you're raising your children. Me too, I have three kids. But the reality is honestly, when somebody is exiting the shelter system, mostly we focus on getting them housed. And even if you listen to the media now, right? We talk a lot about housing, but not so much these other things. Um, and so often we just look at housing and whether they're on welfare or have a minimum wage job and that's enough. But I think we can do better uh, in terms of raising the bar for our young people. So I said I was gonna go back to this and critique a little bit the WHO framework. And so that is what I did. And so this is, this is the new version that I've come up with. So really I just plugged in on the left there um, under policies, which I've already mentioned, a living wage, housing, education. And then we talked about social socioeconomic position and how much power you have in society. And I really came to see identity capital as so important. So, you know, all of us from the minute we're born, um, people say things over us about who we are and what we're capable of becoming. It's both explicit and implicit by where we live and the neighborhood we grow up in. And we internalize that. And that really sets us on this path in life and it determines our socioeconomic uh, uh, position and ultimately the, the amount of power we have in society. So I put identity capital there. I put age there because of the age base and equities that I talked about. And for whatever reason, the WHO didn't have sexual orientation here. So I put that as well. Um, and social capital, I don't know, I didn't point this out, but in the other model, social capital was kind of this cross-cutting determinant because they couldn't decide if it should be more upstream or downstream. But I think for young people, it's really an upstream thing. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is that housing is located here under material circumstances, as is mental health and teaching people coping skills and the healthcare system where we work. But this model is not bi-directional at this level, not my model, not the WHO model, meaning that just because we give somebody a house, it doesn't work backwards and change identity capital. It doesn't change all these other inequities. We have to change those inequities to move young people forward towards equitable and social uh, and economic inclusion. 
And that might seem really obvious after you listen to me talk about this study, but to be honest, I actually didn't realize that. When I went into this study, I thought that if we gave them a house, that everything else would kind of sort itself out and, in, and it didn't. So in terms of implications for policy and practice and research, I, I mentioned some of these already. I think we need more, I don't think, I know, <laughs> we need more affordable and better quality housing. Uh, we might wanna consider a basic income. So sort of putting a floor on, on, on how much poverty we allow someone to be in. Uh, free tuition, I'd love to see that, and no welfare clawbacks when they start getting free tuition. And again, I think we need to adopt a broader uh, perspective on ending homelessness. Again, we hear a lot about, let's just give people a house, but when they look at longitudinal studies, um, people are, are stably housed over time as someone pays their rent. But when you look at other indicators like community integration or even like substance use or mental health, those things don't change compared to treatment as usual, even like six years out. And so we need to look at uh, more supports for people that are ending, that are leaving homelessness. Practice, we don't talk about identity capital a lot um, in the front, on the front lines, and I think we need to. I would like to see us decentralize our outre outreach services to away from the social service sector to less stigmatizing locations. I think we need to develop mentorship programs that foster social capital. I wanna see us redefine success. I think we need to stop patting ourselves on the back when a young person leaves the shelter system and all we've given them is a home and help set them up for welfare payments. And I want us to be really transparent with young people like we would with our own children about the likelihood of escaping poverty with limited education or skills training. For research, I'd like us to measure social inclusion holistically and look at economic participation because it's hard to participate socially if you can't participate economically. We still need more longitudinal studies on this issue. It really helps to capture, I think, some of these real world challenges that I've tried to highlight for you this evening. Of course, I'm gonna say we need more qualitative studies because I'm a qualitative researcher, but I absolutely think that we do to, so that young people can help inform where we're going, what kind of interventions we're designing. And again, I've mentioned this before, and this is something that I'm trying to tackle, um, using social and economic inclusion as a primary outcome measure in intervention studies. So I wanted to show this because when I talk about my work, sometimes people say, okay, that's really good, but what does that have to do with nursing? Like, how are you different from a social worker? And I think the fact that people ask me this is very telling of where, you know, in my 30 years of being a nurse, where we've come. And I think we're sw swinging back the other way, but I think that we've kind of moved away over the years of focusing on the social determinants of health. And there's lots of reasons for that, including funding. I think there tends to be more funding and more sort of downstream individual approaches. But again, I think that that's changing. What I've done here is I've gone in and looked at the entry to practice competencies for 2020, which many of you know have been revamped. Um, and as you can see, this has everything to do with nursing, right? It's the determinants of health, it's uh, population health, critical inquiry, social justice. This in fact is what it means to be a nurse. So I wanted to um, show you a, a clip. This is not broadly available yet. I am leading a study now. So I took those findings. It was really important for me to not just do research to share how bad it is, but actually to do something about it. And so uh, I'm leading a randomized control trial, a mixed method randomized control trial. We were able to give young people, 24 young people, rent subsidies for two years, and half of them are being randomly assigned a mentor. So you remember those three things I said young people need, economic, social, and identity supports. And so the economic supports everybody's getting, and then the social and sort of the identity-based supports we're hoping a mentor can provide. Um, we and then we're shooting a documentary film about this at the same time. And that screening is gonna take place um, hopefully in person, but maybe online in June. And so I just wanna show you, it's a three minute clip and then we'll wrap up and I'm happy to take your questions. When I was growing up, I felt very, very alone. So I always carried a sketchbook with me. It just kind of, it helped fill that void, you know? The Transitioning Youth Out of Homelessness Project 
what we're looking at is social and economic inclusion. If you have a rent subsidy plus a mentor, are you doing better in terms of feeling socially and economically included in society? Once they leave the shelter system, there was kind of this big gap in our knowledge about what happens to these young people. At this point, I have nothing left to hide. We talk a lot about, you know, let's help folks get out of homelessness. And typically we talk about, let's get them a house. A house is not necessarily a home. Home is a different thing. When I was in shelter, I was not seeing myself as that kind of homeless, like stay in the shelter. I'm like, mm -mm, I have to get out from here. Like I have to do things, you know. If you imagine society like a big circle and these young people are on the outside of the circle, what sorts of things do they need to move inside the circle and feel like they belong? I was just coping. I was like, one day, that was always my hope. Like, always, I always said to myself, I'm like, one day all this thing is going to be over. We have to realize that when you've had a history of trauma, that really messes up your sense of self. And so it's a rather simplistic and maybe a privileged notion to think we can just give a young person with all this history of trauma and all these messages in their lives that told them that they didn't belong. Just give them a house and that's going to fix all that. It, well, it's not going to. I was going down a, down a bad, bad path. I know what it feels like to be homeless and I know how it feels like to have nobody. I know what pain feels like, you know? We need to do a better job, and indeed we can do a better job of helping young people exit homelessness. When people hear about homelessness, they literally think, oh, everyone that's homeless is a drug addict or something. Did the best I could, you know? I constantly think about the things that I've been through as inspiration. I think it's dealing with those things that people do to you and the things that you feel and challenging them like I'm doing is one of the best ways to deal with that. Take something ugly and turn it beautiful. Right? Or accept it for what it is and find beauty in that. Okay, so just to wrap up where we began um, with Florence Nightingale, we'll give her the last word. Uh, she said that preventable disease should be looked on as a social crime. And I think that some of the challenges that young people go through, like their mental health challenges, for example, are indeed preventable diseases. And I think as nurses, we can lead the way in exposing and tackling the social structural inequities that cause and prevent these social, social conditions. So that's it for me. And thank you very much for your time. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks very much, Naomi. That was fascinating and just wonderful work. You should be very proud, as should your PhD supervisor. Um, but it, it's really terrific. Let's open it up for questions. If people want to use the chat uh, to enter questions or comments you may have for Naomi, and we can monitor the chat, or you can raise your hand um, if you go to your participants and then, uh, you know, waft over your own name, you can, you have the opportunity to raise your hand if you'd actually like to unmute and ask a question directly of, of Naomi. While, while people are thinking, Naomi, I'm just um, thinking back to, you hear so often now this kind of banner call for housing is health, but, but clearly it's one part of it, right? And yes. I'm thinking about, you know, the initiatives that UHN is coming up with, with partnering in housing, but that's only, you know, a, a small um, piece of the whole story, correct? 
Yeah, thank you, Linda. And to be clear, you know, I absolutely think housing is health. And I think that we need to give folks that are experiencing homelessness a house. What I worry is, though, is that we, if we don't set them up for success, and they don't move forward after we house them. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna blame the individual and we're gonna say, see, like, yeah. you know, they don't wanna go anywhere. And so I yeah. wanna help us set them up for success. Yeah, thanks. Kelly Metcalf, got a question, Kelly. Hi, Naomi, thank you. That was excellent. It was very interesting to hear how you're building on your PhD work. And, and that's the question I have for you because I'm really interested in this intervention. And what does the mentorship involve? So what is it? that you're going to be offering in addition to housing to half of the half of the people that are in, in your study. Hi Kelly, thanks for your question. Yeah, so we're at, we're about at eight coming on our 18 month mark now. Um, so the mentorship, so when I was doing a literature review on mentorship, to be very honest, formal mentorship programs, it's like kind of hit and miss. There's so many nuances associated with connecting with someone, but what actually seems to work is informal mentorship, these people that we kind of naturally connect with. Um, and so I was trying to actually make an informal mentorship program, but that's kind of hard when you're trying to run an intervention. And so all that to say that, um, you know, our community partners in Hamilton, St. Catharines in Toronto helped us recruit mentors and we want it to be as organic as possible. So they, they, are, they meet well before COVID. They were meeting, um, they connect once a week with the, with the young person via text or in person. And then they meet in person uh, once a month. And we just call them coffee chats. And we just want to see where it goes. And we didn't want to be too um, rigid. One of the things I'm, of course, you know this, um, that happens is, especially with these organizations that don't have a lot of money, is researchers come in and they design these fancy projects and then they leave and then the, the, the community doesn't have enough money to sustain, sustain that. So I wanted to do something more organic that providers could sustain after we left. Um, during COVID now, they're meeting, meeting virtually. So, so we'll see if there's gonna be a difference in outcomes between the young people that have mentorship and not. Um, so the mentors are peers. There are other young people who have been through this or? No, great question. No, they're not. They're, so they're adults. We said they have to be at least five years older than the, the young person. We didn't say that wasn't an exclusion criteria that you um, didn't have a history of homelessness, but I just know from knowing the mentors, none of them have that I know of a history of homelessness. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, in the chat iPad 96, which is probably not the real, real name. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime kind of a thing. Yeah. Well um, I, I, I used to, after the earthquake in Haiti, I started going every year and I haven't been for a few years now, but I went about five times. And somebody that ran an NGO told me something that really stuck with me. And he said, you know, we've been coming down here for years before the earthquake. And then the earthquake hit. And we were building homes for people. And he said, we, then the homes were gone. And we realized that we gave um, these people things that, uh, you know, an earthquake, a natural disaster could take away. And he said, now we focus on giving people something that nobody can take away. And so actually they're focused on education. And I think about homelessness like that. And I think about the pandemic, right? And so, so many of the young people that are in the study right now and young people that I'm in touch with for my doctoral work are really struggling um, and they're in danger of losing their homes. Um, so I wanna focus on stuff that even a pandemic can't take away. Just noticing comments in the, um, in the chat, Naomi, uh, from Anne, could you comment on the location of the mentors you pick in the neighborhoods? that would possibly be part of the broader circle of support relationships. What neighborhoods the mentors are from? Yeah. Yeah, so um, just, so the mentors, so we have three sites, Toronto, St. Catharines and Hamilton, and we let our community partners, um, so it's very much a participatory action type of research. So our community partners pick the mentors and the mentors live in Hamilton, St. Catharines and Toronto. And, and Robert, they're sorry, Robert asked oh. if your mentors have uh, some sort of training and are they paid? Yeah, so Covenant House was the only one of our three partners that has had a formal mentorship program. And so they're sort of acting like a role model for the other programs. Um, and, you know, they'll, they'll ask questions like, what are you doing? But we didn't want to, you know, 
to sign up to be a mentor for two years is like it for, for no money is a, is a big ask. And so we didn't want to put too much formal training on them, but it's available. They don't have to attend. There's like quarterly sessions, for example, at Covenant House. And now it's available via Zoom. Um, and so they can get some training that way as well. And they're all quite in touch with the community partners on a regular basis. Thanks. Kelly, did you have your hand up again or that's an old hand up? Um, Judy Dixon asking, have you managed to persuade the powers that be of how to help young people to transition? So I guess capacity to influence policy makers and government and listen, get government to listen to you. Yeah, thank you for that question. So I am, my hope is that actually uh, our, uh, in June, when we present our, po our primary outcome, so our 18 month findings, we're gonna show the film at the same time. And St. Mike's is helping me invite sort of the right folks to come to this screening. Again, with COVID, I don't know what this is gonna look like, um, but I'm hoping, I'm, I'm hoping that some policymakers will be there. You know, ultimately, I mean, we're not doing a cost analysis, but just sort of, you know, back of the napkin kind of thing. Um, it's, you know, giving a young person $500 a month is, is going to be quite a bit cheaper than having spent spending thousands of dollars to have a young person in a shelter and all of uh, what that entails. Um, so I think it makes sense. And I like the idea of a portable rent subsidy, because then you can choose to live in whatever, whatever neighborhood you want to. So often subsidized housing is in, is in neighborhoods, sometimes that not always, but sometimes not the safest neighborhoods for young people and they want to live somewhere else. Um, Victoria's got a comment about working with homeless youth for seven years at Covenant House and one of the biggest challenges were around supporting them until they gained some living skills so that they had a chance to move on. Uh, do you mean like how can we support them? Or? I, think, I think it's Victoria making the comment more than anything yeah. else about yeah. you know, getting them the living skills so that they can become more self-sufficient, I suppose, for one of the yeah. And, and also, I think in, in fairness, I think there's a lot going on. I think for, for charities as well or NGOs, they depend so much on donor support. And so donors want to see, they want to see, hear the success stories, right? And so then that perpetuate, perpetuates saying success stories. At the same time as researchers, we need to do more longitudinal studies, not these sort of these just, you know, cross-sectional studies. We need to show how challenging it is for young people. So I think there's just this big gap in frontline providers' knowledge. Um, and then also, again, this idea of having to fundraise for your organization. And kind of to that point, Naomi, I'm not sure how to phrase this. Do you have data on sort of people who move out of shelters into um, rent market housing, et cetera, but for whatever reason end up back for probably a multitude of reasons, multifactorial, end up back in um, sheltered accommodation or, or without a home? Yeah, good question. We don't have data on like why that happens. Um, I We probably need to, but for example, I'll tell you how often this happens, uh, that, that 2016 study that I was referring to where they looked at 1,100 young people across Canada, 76% of them reported at least two failed attempts at exiting homelessness. So. That's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Judy, have you considered asking members of Soroptimus International to act as mentors? And Emma asked, what kinds of themes are a focus for the mentors to discuss with the young people? Um, is there training that occurred with the mentors prior to the beginning of the study, which I think you might have touched on before? But yeah, is there particular I, areas you want them to focus on when they have the conversation? Again, I, I'm, we're trying to sort of mimic this, you know, especially it's a, it's a pilot, sort of this informal mentorship. And we want them to kind of act like a coach or a cheerleader and, um, you know, not feel like they have to help you know, just, just have someone to have a coffee with and listen to and kind of go wherever it is the young person wants to go. So it's fairly organic and informal. And I actually hadn't heard of, I think it was an organization that you mentioned about mentors. I hadn't heard of that. Uh, Judy Dixon mentioned it, the Seroptimist International. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that. Thank you. Other questions or comments for Naomi? Not seeing anything additional in the. Oh, Marilyn actually had asked what connections have been made with the adult education section of the local school boards, if anything. Have you had any 
connections with them, Naomi? Yeah, I haven't, but I know that, um, so there's somebody else, ironically, her name's Naomi, Naomi Nichols. Uh, she's a researcher in this area, um, and uh, she was at McGill. She just left, actually. But uh, that is her area of research, and I know she's really passionate about it. There's also some initiatives like the Upstream or the Geelong Project out of Australia, where they actually do a screening in the high school system, trying to find young people. So the focus is more on prevention and, and trying to intervene before they end up in the shelter system. Um, there's a comment from Connie. Uh, wonderful work. What have you found in your research related to substance abuse and supports in place for youth? Would mentors be matched that can appropriately guide this subset of homeless youth in recovery? Yeah. Well, I can tell you a couple things. So right now, actually, we just are wrapping up a five-month uh, CIHR-funded study on mental health and substance use during COVID-19. And I can tell you there's uh, not a lot of supports out there for young people in terms of substance use, and even less during COVID. And what is more scary is people have seemed to have lost touch with young people and actually don't know what's going on. So I think we have a lot of work to do in that area. None of the young people in this study are actively struggling with substance use, um, you know, to the point where they wouldn't be able to engage in mentorship. But um, that is an, another really important area of research for sure. I'm not seeing anything else in the chat or hands up. So Naomi, um, recognizing the time and your very valuable time and uh, thank you so much again Naomi for sharing your wisdom with us here tonight a really uh, an imperative topic for us to be thinking about and taking some more action on and really looking forward to seeing uh, how the intervention study works out COVID and all it'll be um, a challenge but we wish you all the very best with that and I'd like to thank everybody who's attended the um, the, this forum for, uh, for taking the time to come and listen to what's been a really interesting uh, project. And Naomi, congratulations on your work today and wish you well. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks everyone for coming. I appreciate your time. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.